seated. One second. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to begin the funeral services of Diane Klebard Silverberg. Rabbi Toby Manwith will be officiating. We welcome those of you who are joining us online. And for those of you who are here, just a last and gentle reminder to be sure your phones have been turned off. Good afternoon. It gives me great, great honor to be standing here today. Um, I was not Diane's rabbi. Diane's rabbi is a dear friend of mine, Rabbi Andrea London, who unfortunately had a trip previously planned. Um, I know that she sat with the family yesterday and um, has asked me to stand in her uh, shoes, which are very big shoes to fill, but it is my great honor to uh, be standing here in her stead to pay tribute and find lasting memory for Diane Klebard Silverberg. Death has taken our beloved Diane. Our friends grieve in their darkened world. In their silence, there is lamentation. In their tears, there is loneliness. Lost in their sorrow, may they find the presence of loving friends. For Diane's love that united us in life, which death cannot sever. For her companionship, we shared a long life's path and which continues through the tenderness of memory. For the gifts of her heart and mind that brought us joy and happiness and is now a precious remembrance. For all those and more, we give our thanks. In this time of grief, we often turn to our sacred scriptures to find comfort. The following is from the very first Psalm. Happy are those who have not followed the counsel of the wicked or taken the path of sinners or joined the company of the insolent. They are like a tree planted beside streams of water that yields fruit in season, whose foliage never fades, whose fruit always flourishes. We continue with the 23rd Psalm, which you have in your booklets. If you'll please join me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anoint my head with oil. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. For everything there is a season, a time for every experience under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance, a time to throw stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to discard, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silent and a time to speak. The poet has written, after my death, mourn me thus. There was a person, and see, they are no more. Before their time, their life was ended, and the song of their life was broken. Oh, they had one more melody, and now that melody is lost forever. Lost forever. It is a custom in 
Judaism to have people speak of a loved one. Before we do, it's our custom to use the words that Job used when death came to his family. Job said, Adonai Natan v'Adonai Lakach Yeshem Adonai Mavorach. God has given, God has taken away, blessed be God's name. Job said that because he was a person of faith, but even for people who are not of faith, Job cried out because we can't understand why someone was given to us, why we enjoyed their life with them and loved and cherished them and why they're taken from us so soon. It's also a Jewish tradition to speak words of our loved ones. Again, I'm going to share words from Rabbi Andrea London, who was a good friend. Uh, I didn't know Diane at all, although I was in the outer circles of uh, David's life and was just, uh, and was just saying to uh, Marissa and David that uh, in the last years of his life, um, I would see these wonderfully happy pictures of the two of them together with huge grins on their faces. Um, and so, though I didn't know her, um, I can feel the happiness that she had in her life and the happiness that she gave others. Here are Rabbi London's words. Everyone in Diane's neighborhood knows the statue of the goose that is on her lawn that she would dress in different outfits. In fact, she had a whole wardrobe of outfits for the goose on her front porch. Her children, David and Marissa, were concerned that perhaps their mother had become the kooky goose lady. But then they saw how much their neighbors, especially the children who would take pictures of the goose, loved the goose. The goose was emblematic of what an amazing connector Diane was. She might not have lived on her house on Elmwood Street for many years, but everyone knew and loved her, and she helped bring the neighborhood together. To those who have known Diane for many years, this was no surprise for them. Diane made friends wherever she went. She was gregarious and liked to bring people together in her home, whether for meals or to watch baseball, which always included a lot of food. If someone asked Diane what they could bring to her home, she would assign them a small dish and then put out a big spread that she had cooked. And she was an amazing cook. Her daughter, Marissa, has been compiling her recipes to share with friends and family. She rented out a bedroom in her home as an Airbnb and loved to meet the people who stayed with her. Even though food wasn't included in the rental, she would often cook something for her guests. Again, those who knew Diane were not surprised by this because she always went above and beyond for people. Diane exemplified the quality of Hachnasat Orchim. She modeled how to bring people together and make them feel comfortable. Whether it was cooking a sumptuous meal, finding just the right present for someone, or leaving an excessive tip for a waitstaff person if the meal was good, Diane was a very generous and giving person. After her daughter Marissa and her son-in-law Will dog sat for her for all of two days, she sent them an enormous care package of food and she purchased warm socks to give as gifts to the people in the neighborhood who walked her dogs for her. Diane had a strong sense of justice and looked out for the underdog. Growing up, she confronted bullies in the playground and looked out for her younger brother, Ken. She was fierce about standing up for her values and protecting her family. In her career as an attorney, she looked out for people being victimized. She represented incarcerated clients and was committed to giving back to the community. In 2022, she was honored with the Award for Excellence in Pro Bono and Public Interest Service. I, Rabbi London, met Diane when she was dating David Steiner. She and David were an amazing pair. They enjoyed each other's company and shared a passion for social justice and love of family. 
Diane's father lived in an apartment in their home, and she cared for him until he died. She allowed her father to remain independent and not move into assisted living. Diane had a boisterous laugh, which she shared freely when she was with David. David used to say she was strong, smart, and sensitive. Everyone who knew Diane would concur with David's three S's. David's sudden death was shocking and very sad. Over the last six years since David's death, Diane kept up her work as an attorney, moved to a new home, adopted a few dogs, established a new community, and continued to be an amazing mother and friend. <coughs> Diane was a very empathetic person and could detect the subtleties of emotions in people. She was also willing to be vulnerable with people and modeled how to be an authentic person. Diane was born in New York and grew up in Madison, Wisconsin, where her father was a professor at the university and her mother was a music teacher and B'nai Mitzvah tutor. Diane has one younger brother, Ken, and a very small family that lived in New York. Most of the family's relative had perished in the Holocaust. Diane was close to her parents and her brother. She got her spirit, goofiness, strength, and musical talent from her mother, and was intellectual and independent like her father. She was raised in an intellectual home and community where many people were professors at the university. Diane was an excellent student, competitive swimmer, and an accomplished musician. In the late 70s, she took the stage to play flute with Chuck Mangione at a concert in Madison. She studied at the University of Wisconsin, where she was Phi Beta Kappa and earned a bachelor's degree in English and philosophy. She also went to law school at the University of Wisconsin. Diane was super smart, had an extensive vocabulary, loved books, and was an excellent writer. After law school, she practiced law in St. Louis, where she met Mark Silverberg, her former husband and father of her children, Marissa and David. She had a very successful career as a litigator and was admired by colleagues. She was a tireless advocate for her clients, and she enjoyed mentoring colleagues. She was delighted when Marissa married Will. Will saw Diane as a mother and was moved that Diane welcomed him into the family so warmly. Diane was very excited that Marissa was pregnant and attended the 20-week ultrasound appointment with her. Diane purchased a lot of clothes, stuffed animals, and a stroller for her grandchild in utero. As we say goodbye to Diane today, we are so appreciative of the many gifts she shared with us. We're grateful for her hearty laugh and her zest for life, her generous heart, and her open spirit. She modeled consummate hospitality. She knew how to bring people together and be a good neighbor. Many people saw Diane as a member, as a mentor or second mother, but Marissa and David knew they were lucky because she was actually their mother. Marissa and David, she encouraged you to be well-rounded, to appreciate music and the arts, to be intellectually curious, and to play sports. Most importantly, David and Marissa, she loved you fiercely. You are her most important and enduring legacy. In the Torah portion we read this week, Jacob leaves home after stealing his brother Esau's birthright and then tricking his father Isaac into giving him the blessing due to the firstborn. The first night in the wilderness, Jacob sleeps with a rock in his pillow and has an amazing dream in which he envisions a ladder connecting heaven and earth with angels ascending and descending on it. At the top of the ladder, he has a vision of God. When he awakes, surprised that he's not alone in a desolate place, he exclaims, God was in this place, and I, I did not know it. To all those who knew and loved Diane, especially her beloved brother Ken and children, Melissa and David, I pray that whenever you feel as though you are in the wilderness without Diane, you will remember her love and encouragement, her sense of humor, her generosity, or even a silly outfit she bought on Etsy for the goose statue. 
And at that moment, maybe when you least expect it, you'll exclaim, I feel Diane's presence, and I am grateful for all the ways her life touched me. May God comfort you among all the mourners of Zion and Jerusalem, and may Diane's memory be a blessing as you keep it alive in the stories you tell about her and in the way you live your life. It's now my deep honor to call friends and family who will share their own remembrances. We call first uh, Ken, and then Marissa, followed by David, followed by Julie. I want to thank um, everyone who's here today uh, to honor Diane's memory. And bear with me, because this is going to be difficult. <laughs> um, Diane was my big sister, and I want to share a few things about her. Um, but before I do that, I want to, um, as everyone knows, she was an extrovert that had many friends. She made friends wherever she went and she thrived in those friendships through thick and thin and knowing all the the love that you bring to this day and that you're here to honor her memory would, would mean a lot to her um diane and i were always extremely close to each other um and that lasted nearly six decades we were fortunate that um, other than a few years when she was in St. Louis and I was in law school in California, we lived close together, we stayed close together, we visited, we spoke, um, and we stayed super close with our parents. Um, Diane and I grew up in a very small family. Uh, after my father moved to, to Madison in 1963, we had no relatives within about a thousand miles of us. Um, my dad was an only child. My mom had two siblings. Uh, we had three cousins, but nobody close. Um, I'm sure it's hard to imagine for, for Diane's kids and mine, but when we grew up, there was no internet. There was no cable TV. There was no video cassette. There was no Blu-ray. There was no streaming. We had three TV stations and the PBS. Um, and so we really had to entertain ourselves and keep ourselves intellectually stimulated. Um, because of that, Diane and I spent a lot of time together uh, with our family, with each other, with our shared group of friends. Um, there were board games, you know, Scrabble, Yahtzee, things in the neighborhood. We'd go fossil hunting with my mom at the nearby rock quarries, uh, play flashlight tag go ice skating together in the cold Wisconsin winters. Uh, we both swam competitively at the Hill Farm Swim Club um, and spent a lot of time together. Diane and I went to music lessons together and, and she was admittedly a much better musician than I was, but I can say this now, she cheated because she actually practiced between lessons. Um, in school, Diane was my, my big sister and my protector. Um, you may wonder about the protector part. You heard a little bit. Madison in the 60s and 70s was a pretty bucolic place other than the occasional war protests when we were growing up. Um, but we did have some bullies in the neighborhood. And one uh, in particular, Jeremy, lived down the block from us on Marathon Drive. And Diane um, took it upon herself at a young age to protect Jeremy's targets, including me. And um, you know, back then I was a foot shorter and, and maybe 150 pounds lighter than today. And there's a great picture that Diane has of herself with her flexing her arms, shoot, <laughs> bulging biceps and six pack abs and was incredibly strong. And um, one day I think Jeremy tried to go after me after school and Diane, I think almost knocked him out. And uh, his mom decided to, to take revenge and, and drove up to our house and demanded that we come outside 
And uh, when she saw Diane's bulging bicep, she said that Diane needed to register her arms as lethal weapons. And that was, <laughs> that was the end of the bullying. Um, Diane also protected me from myself. I had a, um, a knack for getting into trouble in high school in, in every way imaginable, and she was always there to, to uh, have my back. And it was not always easy, I know, for her. Um, I remember one night I managed to um, somehow get myself home on my bicycle. I don't remember how, and apparently she was in the downstairs rec room having a romantic moment with her high school boyfriend, and I... <laughs> I barged in and locked myself in the bathroom and, and vomited and everything, including the medicine cabinet, which I'm told was particularly hard to clean up. Um, and they had to carry me upstairs. And of course, I don't remember uh, um, anything about that until she constantly reminded me of it. Um, she also did a particularly good job of um, covering for me uh, when I did things like pierce my ear, which back then was not such a common thing and, and generally wreaked havoc when my parents were off in Japan for an extended uh, trip while my dad was teaching there and I managed to do quite a few things at the house that my mom immediately um, detected when she got back. Um, whereas I was very much carpe diem in high school, Diane was always the exemplar student. Um, she was beloved by her, her teachers, she achieved a ton of academic um, recognition. She excelled in her, her schoolwork. Uh, she was voted by her classmates to serve as a student representative on the, um, on the Madison Board of Education, and she was an excellent musician, and you heard about her uh, you know, performance with Chuck Mangione in 1977 at the UW Union Theater, um, and she continued to be very um, active in, in music, even when she had so many other things going on in her life. Um, at the other end of the accomplishment bell curve in, in high school was me. And um, as someone who, uh, at least in my recollection, did no homework in high school, I'm thinking of you, Joey Cleburne, um, uh, I, I was able to really ride on, on Diane's coattails. and. Um, you know, I, I made a point of letting the teachers know that I was Diane's brother. Um, and I think, although Diane later became very proud of me, I think at that time when the teachers asked Diane if I was her brother, she managed to feign a very confused look on her face and, and hope that, that it passed with that. Um, the next chapter of our lives was terrific. We, um, Diane stayed in Madison for college and law school. We. We lived in the same uh, house that we rented. Uh, we were roommates. We had other roommates. Um, I was doing my part to contribute to UW-Madison's reputation as a party school, um, but we had a lot of fun. We always had nacho parties on Sunday nights and watched reruns of Batman and, and Star Trek and made a lot of friends and had great times with our roommates. Diane also protected me and, and guided me uh, through college and really um, showed me how to turn around things academically so that I could uh, do something other than have all C's in college. Uh, Diane is also the reason I chose law as a profession, and it's, it's one that provides me with immense satisfaction as it, as it provided to her. Uh, I'd never really planned on going to law school, but I saw how interesting and stimulating it was for her and how successful she was even as a young lawyer. And after talking to her about it, I decided that once again, I would follow in her footsteps. Um, even after I graduated from law school and uh, Diane and I were both in Chicago, which was fantastic. That was starting in 1989. Diane continued to serve as my protector and my mentor. Um, whenever I had a a legal question, because I didn't know what I was doing, nobody does as a first year lawyer, had an issue with how to deal with a colleague, a judge, a complex legal problem. She was always there for me and her, her guidance was, was spot on. Um, her, she excelled in her career. You, you heard about some of her highlights. She loved doing pro bono work. She reckon, was recognized for that. She, she had a very complicated case in the Illinois Supreme Court that I know she was very nervous about and it was being closely watched around the country and, and she won that case. She, she handled the whole thing herself. Um, although Diane worked his entire, her entire adult life as a, 
a career and um, if there's any other lawyers out there you know it's more than a full-time job but she managed to make the time for the things that were most important to her especially her family um, Diane always cherished her her close and her extended family and her friends um, not only was she always present in my life but she was always present in my parents um, lives when they were alive and, and gave them amazing comfort and support uh, as you heard after my father had some health issues um, and spent time uh, taking turns living with us which I'll say you know six months at my house probably aged my house by about five years Diane then got to um, have my dad the pleasure of having my dad uh, live in a two flat uh, together in Evanston where he, he was fiercely independent he after he had his first open heart surgery he had his former secretary break him out of the nursing home because they didn't want to even stay there for two days for rehab and so Diane really took care of him um, and allowed him to 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 live uh, you know uh, with, with with great dignity um, and I'll be attorney eternally indebted to her for that um, Sorry, I, I was. Diane promised that I sh me that I would or made me promise to her that I'd only take five minutes, and I'm probably already over that. Um, sorry, Diane. Um, Marissa and David, you both know how extremely proud uh, Diane was of both of you. She would regularly um, cavil to me about your latest accomplishments, your personal interests, your hobbies, your academic work, your travel, your personal lives and literally every one of uh, your accomplishments and she was overjoyed when when Marissa married the the love of her life Will Cowell um, and I know obviously she was uh, thrilled to death to, when she found out that Marissa was pregnant I know it's gonna be an extremely difficult time for you and there's no words that I can offer to comfort you but I want you to know that the two of you were the, always the most important thing to your mom um, and that she loved you more than anything else in the world. And um, she left this earth knowing that the two of you would continue your own successes and carry on her legacy. Um, I'm also really happy that you're both able to spend so much time with Diane during her, um, this entire period of her illness. Um, in her final days, you, you both literally put your lives on hold so that you could take care of her and you gave her the best care that anyone could, could have ever given her. Um, you need to know that, that our family, my family, will always welcome you. You always have a place at our house and, and in our family. Um, I promise I'm wrapping up soon. Um, these last few weeks have been really difficult. I know there's a lot of you um, who share in our, um, in our grievance. Um, I, one of the things that Diane made me when we talked about this, she did not want people to be sorrowful. After she passed, she, she wanted people to celebrate her life. And that's what I ask each of you to do. Um, there's a, there's a, just a, a few people I really need to single out who there's so many people provided her support from near and far, but I know her colleague, Rob Kogan, um, took care of her at work, and they, they kept her, you know, as a partner, and, and even throughout this whole thing, even though she wasn't working. Um, Diane's many neighbors in, in Evanston who um, helped her, visited her, gave her meals, walked the dogs, tried to prevent the parking tickets from stacking up in her bright red Mini Cooper. Um, our longtime friend and, and former roommate who attended some of the nacho parties with us, uh, Sarah Martina Healthman, um, and, and her wife, uh, Marcia Martinez Healthman, who happened to be in Philadelphia where Diane was getting treatment and they opened up their home to her, uh, took care of her, took her to doctor's appointments, and she could never have made it this uh, far without their support. Um, I also want to thank her, her dear friends, uh, Pam and Chuck X, Andrea Brown, Lisa Steiner, Julie Kawada. Each of you were frequent visitors to, to Diane. Um, 
took care of her. You know, Lisa accompanied Diane to, to trips to Philadelphia for her treatment. Um, her Chicago friends helped her with her affairs, helped her with meals, and, and really took care of her um, so much, especially in these last uh, few months. And she never would have gotten through it without you. Um, you know, as I said, Diane want, wanted us to celebrate her life. <laughs> so I just ask that when you um, think of Diane, keep in your memories to the laughter and the friendships and the joy that you shared. And think of the way that she made you feel when she was with you. She was always warm and inviting and caring and always made the time to, to speak with everyone, even if she had a, a, a big group at her house. And and cared about everyone. And if you think of Diane in that way, and particularly the, the warmth that you felt when you were with her, then and keep Diane in your memory that way, then I, you'll have, have achieved her, her final wish of celebrating her life and not becoming overwhelmed in sorrow. Thank you. I've been thinking so much about the right words to encapsulate who my mom was, while also knowing there's no way to boil down the essence of someone who is so vibrant and multifaceted into something short and sweet. My mom self-described as a fighter. I think of her more as a defender, using her fighting spirit, her quick wit, and her extensive vocabulary in the name of fairness and protecting the underdog. As a child, my mom was, in her own words, a bully of the bullies. She'd fight the kids who picked on others, including her brother Ken. Not that he was one of those kids <laughs> that got picked on. Um, even becoming the de facto bodyguard for one often bullied kid by routinely walking him home from school. Just this past summer, she received an award for her extensive pro bono work for an incarcerated person that she had been assigned to defend years ago and for whom she had continued to advocate. She looked out for others always, whether a rescue dog looking for a home or a neighbor in need. And if it came down to it, she could throw a punch, as she did as a young adult when she noticed a guy wearing a swastika pin while waiting for pizza at Rocky Rococo's in Madison. Um, my mom was also an incredible nurturer. Oftentimes, Diane nurtured through food. When Will and I were sick with COVID right after moving into our new home this summer, my mom made a batch of chicken soup and matzo balls and delivered it to us even though it meant driving into the city only to drop it off and then turn right back around. When we quickly polished it off about a day later, she was back with another freshly cooked batch to make sure we got through okay. Up until her last few months, my mom made challah and Shabbat dinner weekly for an elderly neighbor. During the lockdown, she brought home-cooked meals for neighbors going through a hard time. There were, of course, many barbecues, holiday meals, and other big food-centric gatherings in which our bodies were nurtured by her amazing cooking and our spirits were nurtured by her presence, warmth, and generosity. She seized any occasion, big or small, to gather people in her home, make them feel loved, and serve them a home-cooked, possibly multi-course meal. She also showed her care and nurturing spirit in her efforts to find just the right thing for the right person. She loved her online shopping, and eBay and Etsy certainly facilitated her efforts to find the perfect gift. In her last weeks, packages were still arriving with items for people she wanted to show her love and appreciation for, such as warm socks for her neighbors generously walking her dogs. She was really looking forward to being a grandma and wanted to be called Mama Klebs. I was really looking forward to her being a grandma as well. But I'm sure this surprises no one. The future nursery is already well stocked with drawers of adorable baby clothes, beautiful picture books, and stuffed animals lovingly picked out by my mom. As my mom declined, I found myself thinking about one of her favorite literary characters, Charlotte from E.B. White's Charlotte's Web. Charlotte, of course, is a canonical nurturer and defender with a way with words. 
I remember talking to my mom on the phone in fall of 2015 about a segment we had both heard on NPR about Charlotte's Web, in which they had read Charlotte's final moments. My mom said she was so teary hearing it that she had had to pull over the car. I only recently thought to ask her if her penchant for sparing spiders that she found in the house had anything to do with Charlotte, and it turns out it did. Um, anyways, I've been reading Charlotte's parting words to Wilbur for comfort, and now I'll share some of them with you. Um, when Wilbur asks Charlotte why she did so much for him, Charlotte replies, you have been my friend. That in itself is a tremendous thing. I wove my webs for you because I liked you. After all, what's a life anyway? We're born, we live a little while, we die. A spider's life can't help but being something of a mess with all this trapping and eating flies. By helping you, perhaps I was trying to lift up my life a trifle. Heaven knows anyone's life can stand a little of that. I think my mom felt similarly. Her life wasn't without challenges, to say the least, but she created joy in some of her hardest times by connecting with, supporting, and bringing out the best of others. And in this way, despite her being gone far too soon, my mom lived a very full and vibrant life. I knew I should have printed my speech, but it's loading on my phone right now. You think there's better service if I step outside for a sec? I don't know. It says one bar. Let's see if I could get this to load. Do you think I could step there and maybe it'll... It might have been hard for you to hear, so um, David's speech was on his phone, and he was having a little bit of trouble getting it to um, pop up. So he just walked into another room, see if he could get some cell service to get it to pop up, and we're gonna we're gonna work from there. So if you'll just give us uh, and him a moment, and we'll see what we can do. Um, sure. Yeah. Why don't you come? Why don't tell you what we're gonna? Yeah. Why don't you come? Uh, this room, this full room, is a testament to who Diane Klebard Silverberg is. I didn't have to look behind me. Now I'm seeing you all, and we all know what an amazing person she is. So I'm going to start out. There's going to be some repetition here of words, but... I'm going to start out with beautiful, strong, caring, generous, fearless, brave, confident, warm, loving, vulnerable, zealous advocate for justice. You've heard that already a couple times. Formidable litigator. I never wanted to be on her opposite side. And fortunately, I wasn't. Loving mom. Loyal friend. Woman of incredible integrity. And you've heard this several times. Outspoken on social issues. So these are some of the words that come to mind when I think of my dearest friend. And I'm sure that Many of you have similar words and thoughts about Diane and many more of your own. So the first time I met Diane, I was on the bleachers for my son's Matt's baseball game. And this beautiful, beautiful woman with a radiant smile walks up to me and said, hi, my name is Diane Klebard and Silverberg. And 
I understand that our boys share the same bar mitzvah date. We bonded from that moment on. We met over and bonded over baseball, our kids, our families, and many girls' nights out together. You've heard many times how generous and caring Di is. Well, here's my example. Um, Passover was shortly after my mother passed away, and I resisted the invitation from Diane to join her and her family uh, for Passover dinner, but she just insisted. That's who Diane is. And as soon as I learned, uh, well, and I've, I've come since to know that she thrives by doing for others. As we sat down for Passover dinner, We looked at the Seder plate, and there was something I had never seen on a Seder plate, and that was an orange. And Diane explained that her mother had started that tradition and that the orange represented feminism. She explained that the famous origin of the story in the tradition when a Dr. Susanna Herschel was lecturing in Miami and speaking about feminism, and an orthodox man shouted out to her, a woman belongs on the bima as much as an orange belongs on the Seder plate. And so as feminist women added the orange as an act of resistance and a symbol of women's rights, that, that was my friend Diane. She was, as you've heard several times, she was a defender and she was a protector of her children and her family. When Marissa was in junior high, she had an AOL instant messaging account. And that account was hacked into by someone impersonated, someone or people impersonating Marissa and making very inappropriate comments. Protective mom went into action. She, she first sought out the Riverwoods police where she lived to ask for their help, but, it was, but was frustrated. She got nowhere, but not, nothing was going to stop Diane. So then she moved on to the state's attorney's office, and I remember her saying, she said, I'm not going to be stopped. I'm going to, I'm going to find out what happened here. So, and she did. She discovered uh, the individuals, or you know, the state's department uh, attorney's office helped her discover the individuals who, uh, who were doing this and got the parents involved to ultimately send a letter of apology to Marissa, and I'm sure that, and believe there was some discipline involved for those young people. But the thing that was really insightful to me was when M Marissa and I were remembering this yesterday, is Marissa said to me, you know, yes, it was difficult. Yes, it was very stressful. But you know what? All along, I knew my mom would handle this. And it was all be OK, and it was. Quick David story. You know, David and Matt played ball together for years and years. And there was one particular ball game, Mark will remember this vividly, that there was a very overly aggressive pickoff attempt with David was on base. And it was a baseball game, uh, Deerfield High School versus GBN, and uh, David's knee was injured. And so he was on crutches for, for quite a while. Um, let's say Diane was not happy with the young lad who did this to her son. Di and I were on a journey together to start a phase two in our lives. Di wrote my J-Date ads for me, which fortunately I did not need to post because I it was introduced to friends. I was introduced to Marcus by friends. We had planned to go to a restaurant in Lake Geneva 
a bunch of my friends to celebrate my face too. And we were going to go out to a wonderful restaurant and enjoy a, me a meal together. But Di insisted that, oh, why don't I make you all a meal? That's who Di, wa Di was. So I'm, I'm smiling at Monica. She, she was part of that crew. So instead of going to dinner at a restaurant, Diane made us the most amazing meal that we, we all enjoyed. We laughed. We ate. It was wonderful. Diane shared her adventures in dating with me a few date, with, uh, on a few dates. I met few, a few of her dates. In fact, I spilled red wine on one of them, which we continue to laugh about through the years. But her dating came to a, an abrupt end when she met David. Di fell in love with David. They were a wonderful match. And she embraced David's family, and they embraced her. After David tragically died, Dave bravely set out on another new start, moving from the home she shared with David and family on Central Avenue. She moved to 1200 Elmwood in Evanston. She loved the neighborhood, and you heard several times the neighborhood loved her. You know, you've heard about this goose, and I admit that when Diane told me she was so excited she was going to pick up this concrete goose, I, I you know, I love Diane. I went along with it. I said, I'm, but I'm thinking to myself, what the heck are you doing? But I, you know, I, she was excited, so I'm like, oh, that's great. I'm going to be excited, too. I had no clue. But... I had no idea why she or anyone else would, would do that. I soon learned, as everyone in the neighborhood learned, she parked the goose on the corner where everyone could see it outside in the front yard, and Di would dress up the goose. You've heard some of this, but it's just only Diane would do this, be this creative and do this, where she, she bought all these outfits on Etsy, and people just couldn't wait to see what was going to be on this goose. Families, children, me, right? You just didn't know. It was wonderful. It brought people together. She also, unfortunately, dressed the goose up in a, as a Packer uniform, which was the only one I really had a hard time with. But beyond that, I was okay. Diane hosted several co uh, house concerts at her home in Elmwood. It, again, it was bringing people together, inviting many neighbors and friends. She hit, you've heard about she had an Airbnb. And yes, there was some financial benefit to that Airbnb, but it was really more about nurturing friendship, uh, have, you know, being able to make meals for people. You heard that she had, she had recently be take, been taking care of a neighbor who was very sick. That's who Diane was. So here's the final and last comment uh, on, on my dear friend Diane. Even as her disease progressed and wore her down, she still found energy somehow to support her family and her friends. Our daughter, our daughter Sarah, we hosted an engagement party for her in July. And Diane insisted on making a charcuterie board for that event. Um, and I don't know how she did this, but she actually attended the event in between scans at Lutheran General Hospital. She also tried so hard to battle her way to our dear friend Cindy's son's Jared's wedding. It was so important that she get there. She did everything in her power to do it. And then sadly, she was so disappointed that she couldn't make it. But she tried so hard. Beautiful, strong, caring, generous, 
fearless, brave, confident, warm, loving, vulnerable, zealous advocate for justice, formidable litigator, loving mom, loving friend, woman of great integrity, outspoken of social issues, a huge bright light in this world went out and she will be so dearly missed by so many. My mom was a, a constant source of encouragement in my life. She pushed me to take difficult coursework and to learn from my failures. She got me to take on orchestral music for 11 years, and she encouraged me to study philosophy and to read the classics. She also inspired me to learn another language. My mom would always tell me that the world is my oyster. My mom was decidedly humanist, which helps to explain the bliss she felt last April, where she spent a very joyful week in Paris with her kids. Since her initial treat diagnosis three years ago, my mom knew that this disease would be her final adversary. When I became aware of the enormity of the situation, um, I feared that she would no longer be able to enjoy her life in anticipation of what was in store. But my mom found real joy in the last few years of her life. My mom loved her neighborhood in Evanston, where she became somewhat of a sensation for the goose. Um, I cannot tell you how many times I saw the kids of the neighborhood tenderly hugging this goose, whether it was dressed as a peacock, pilgrim, UW cheerleader, or Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, and she loved to entertain guests and hang out with her dogs, Bertie and Jack. She loved to express gratitude towards loved ones by finding the perfect gift and she loved to tell me and my sister that she was proud of us. We love my mom very much and we'll miss her dearly. May her memory be a blessing. Thank you all so much for your amazing, loving words, which brought so many parts of Diane's life to all who are here today. When, uh, when Ken was speaking and talking about honoring her memory, I was thinking about uh, what we say when we leave a cemetery. I know that some of you will be with us uh, when we go and some won't. And it's traditional when we leave a cemetery to say, now go forth in peace to life. And I think that hearing all of your words, that that would be an incredible way uh, to honor Diane's memory, to go forward and help those who need help and give dignity to those who, need, who, who are in need of dignity and a good laugh to those who are used to seeing a goose on a street corner, that we should all go forth, maybe not peaceful yet today, maybe our hearts aren't there yet, but go forth ready to embrace life to its fullest eat a great meal, right? Tell your kids you're proud of them. Go shop on Etsy. God, you gave us loved ones and make them the strength of our life, the light of our eyes. They depart and leave us bereft on a lonely way. You are the living fountain from which our healing flows. To you, the stricken look for comfort and the sorrow-laden look for consolation. 
Oh God, we see life as through windows that open on eternity. We see that love endures and the soul endures, as you, O oh God, endure forever. We see that the years are more than grass that withers, more than flowers that fade. They weave a timeless pattern in a world that is the dwelling place of your love and glory. In Jewish custom, we conclude with a prayer that asks that the loved one finds a place in uh, eternity safely and finds a place wherever we think that the next life takes us. Before I recite that prayer uh, before you, I ask that all of us take a moment in silence for your own private remembrances. We rise. El Malay Rahamim Shohen Bamromim Hamse Menuchan Efona Tahat Khan Fashrina. Im kiroshimu tehorim kizhor harakia masirim et nishmat vora barchayim vabela shahalo lama bal harachamim yashirenu beseter kanfav lo lamim. Vayitzror bitzror chayim et nishmata Adonai hu nachlata v'yanuach b'shalom al mishkava v'nomar amen. Compassionate God, eternal spirit of the universe, grant perfect rest in your sheltering pleasant presence to Diane, who has entered eternity. O God of mercy, let her find refuge in your eternal presence and let her soul be bound up in the bond of everlasting life. May she rest in peace and let us together say, Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, the interment service will continue at Memorial Park Cemetery located at 9900 Gross Point Road here in Skokie. The family will be returning to the Klebard residence at 2285 West Course Drive in Riverwoods. They'll be together today following the interment, then Sunday from 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. Memorial contributions in her memory to the Wisconsin Youth Symphony Orchestras or the Wills Eye Hospital. That information you'll find on the service folder. And for the many, many people that are watching us online, the, all that information you could find on our website. For those of you who will be driving in the funeral procession to the cemetery, the procession will be forming in our parking lot. Please obtain an orange safety funeral sticker to place on the right-hand side of your windshield. Have your bright lights and hazard lights on at all times. For additional measures of safety, we will be providing a car in the back of the procession to hopefully keep other cars from entering the procession. For your own personal safety, I strongly recommend using your horn liberally as you're going through the intersections. Please do not speak or text on your cellular phone while driving to a cemetery. Also, ladies and gentlemen, please keep in mind that Shabbat comes in early. When we get to the cemetery, please do not approach the family. Let's do the burial in a dignified, respectful manner. We'll have a shura, a double aisle, the immediate family will walk through. And if you're going to see the family, you could see them at the Shiva home or briefly at the cemetery. 
At this time, I invite everyone to please rise and stand in place. As the pallbearers come forward, for those of you who are asked, please come forward. If you're going to the cemetery, please go directly to your cars. And also, if you need to go, uh, you could use this door over here. As Diane's casket is taken to the hearse, again, for those of you who are going to the cemetery, just pause for a moment, then go to your cars. If you're not going to the cemetery, um, you can return to your cars immediately and try to have a restful Shabbat. Family.